Good afternoon and welcome to the Stib Night Gold Project webinar series brought to you by Midas Gold. The goal of these webinars that we are providing is to essentially provide a platform for the public to still have access to information and project updates through this unique time that we find ourselves in social distancing and working from home. Today we are fortunate to have with us one of our consultants, Rob Richardson, who I'm going to let introduce himself. Great, thank you, Ailey. Uh, like Haley said, I'm Rob Richardson. I'm a consultant for the Midas Gold Project, and we've been working on this for about three, three and a half years now. Um, our company is called Rio Applied Science and Engineering, located here in Boise, and we specialize in stream and habitat restoration. And that's what Midas Gold has hired us to do. And we've had an excellent working relationship with the folks at Midas and focusing specifically on uh, how we can restore the project site, not just the proposed impacts associated with the Midas Gold project, but a number of legacy impacts that exist on the site today. And Midas Gold has been really good in listening to our feedback along the line, along the way and engaging us to help ensure that the restoration project is maximizing habitat potential, not just um, picking up the loose pieces at the end, but actually doing a, a really nice job of pulling everything together. And so that's what I wanna walk folks through today is a little bit about the restoration design associated with the project and how we're gonna evaluate that when it's all done. So Haley and Shelley, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions since you're the only two on this live recording, uh, but hopefully this will provide some answers uh, for people in the virtual world out there since you can't be sitting with us. With that, I'm gonna move forward. Maybe. There it goes, got a bit of a delay, sorry. Okay, so the Stib Night Gold Project, you know, this is an area that's been an active mining uh, region for a very long time, and there are a number of uh, significant legacy issues, but the goal of Midas Gold in bringing industry to this area is to restore the project site, and that includes a number of the historical legacy issues as well as those uh, that would be associated with the proposed mine. And, and this is a real a new, sort of concept for a lot of people. And, and I've had the opportunity to work on at some other mines and, and it, is, it is pretty unique that um, they're actually seeking to restore the project, not just do the sort of minimal rec reclamation. And so that's what I wanna focus on is the restoration component because obviously that's what we're doing. And this is a picture that I took of the uh, a cascade down into Yellow Pine Pit and we'll talk about this. This is one of the legacy issues that it's been a <clears throat> fish passage barrier for uh, 80, 90 years now, and no migratory or anadromous ocean-going fish have been able to pass this to access some of their natal spawning grounds in the headwaters of the East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon River. So restoration, I said, you know, a lot of other projects uh, are focused more on reclamation, and, and this project is very much focused on restoration, which is what we specialize in. And we, most of our projects are actually strictly restoration based for salmon and habitat recovery. And we work a lot through Washington, Idaho, and Oregon uh, along those lines. And it's been a good partnership with Midas to try to move more from the reclamation side, which you see on the left image, which is really focused on creating a stable environment, but maybe not one that's natural or deformable, dynamic and resilient, like a natural stream channel would be. And so these photos help illustrate that. They're both actually on site, both on Meadow Creek and in the area on the left, this was, had been reclaimed and left in a, in a condition that's very stable but doesn't provide a lot of habitat. Meanwhile, the photo on the right was restored a, a, about a mile downstream. And this is a good example of what we're aiming to do on the rest of the project area. Okay, so our goals, of course, you know, they're often related to fish and for good reason. The fish that are up there, both Chinook salmon and steelhead, but also bull trout and cutthroat trout, they're indicator species. They're like bellwethers of the larger um, e ecology and the aquatic ecosystem. So if we can restore habitat that's suitable and optimized for those fish, it often therefore is, is optimized for those other, other aquatic uh, species. So we have three sort of principal goals to restore passage at Yellow Pine Pit, that image I showed you a couple slides ago, so that fish can access those uh, native spawning grounds that they haven't been able to access for decades. 
um, to restore spawning and rearing habitats. So a number of legacy issues that exist. And then obviously as a result of impacts due to the proposed mine, those will be first reclaimed, but then restored over the top of some of those features. And I'll, I'll illustrate that to you. So that at the end of the day, we leave the, the site in a condition that's suitable for those fish to uh, survive and, and flourish. And then ultimately, during the whole process, of course, to minimize the incidental take or the accidental killing of animals. And so obviously, if you're moving streams around, there are fish in those streams at that time. And so those fish get moved to areas where they're safe while the work is occurring. And then once the streams are restored, they're moved back into those areas. And so the results, of course, will provide, hopefully, uh, improved access, but also habitat for fish and the other aquatic species that go with them. All right, a quick graphic here. There are three slides. The left is the baseline. That's today. And you can see, it, I'm going to use my pointer here, you can see all of the, the yellow areas. Those represent relic or legacy features, legacy mine impacts. And so those have been there for anywhere from uh, 90 to 80 to you know, you know, decades, many years. And the streams have been routed through those and impacted. Uh, the proposed project, as illustrated in the middle slide, shows both an overlay in yellow of the historical impacts, but also the blue represents the proposed impacts from the Midas Gold project. And you can see Midas Gold has, has endeavored to maintain most of their uh, features within the existing legacy uh, impact areas to try to minimize any new impacts. Uh, but then a number of the relic features would also be restored, even though they're not being impacted directly by Midas Gold. And the image on the right illustrates the proposed stream channel and <clears throat> where it is proposed to flow over the top of some of the proposed features. So there will be rock, uh, development rock that's removed over the top of the ore bodies, and those get deposited in a handful of locations to place them out of the way. And then once the mining actually occurs and the ore is extracted, the tailings associated with that ore will be deposited and those create new features on the landscape. And once they're there, we can restore the streams over the top of them. So the streams will be diverted around during the mining and then restored over the top afterward. All right, one of the keynote features of this uh, project area is the Yellow Pine Pit. And this is an oblique aerial view looking at the Yellow Pine Pit, some people locally call it the glory hole, and the east fork of the south fork of the salmon is flowing toward us in this picture. It's flowing from south to north, and it comes down and it drops down this cascade. That was that picture at the beginning of the presentation. It's a very steep drop that fish are unable to ascend. And so this is a, a complete barrier to all species of fish. And then uh, as the, it, the flow goes into this, what is the Yellow Pine Pit Lake, and then back out. And the proposal during the project is to create a tunnel. Now we flipped around and we're looking the other way now, we're looking downstream, so from south to north, and the flow would, is proposed to go through a tunnel around the pit. Now this was done historically to mine this in the first place, although the tunnel went the other way, and it was a tunnel that was relatively small and unable to pass fish, but in evaluating the size of the tunnel needed to get the water out of the pit for the mining activities, it's determined that the gradient of that tunnel is such that you can actually pass fish up that with some modifications, essentially a fish ladder. And there's another uh, webinar series that will be dedicated to the tunnel, so I'm not gonna go into the detail, but there are examples of similar long fishways in which uh, fish are able to ascend and therefore access those areas that were otherwise unavailable upstream. So this tunnel is, a, is an interim measure that allows fish passage up and down and water passage down during mining. But at the end of the project, this area is proposed to be filled and a natural stream over the top. So the long-term solution is that there would be a, a newly formed stream channel over the top of the old yellow pine pit allowing fish passage. So what happens upstream of that barrier? Uh, I put together this slide that illustrates that there are several miles. There's actually about 25 miles of perennial stream upstream of the existing barrier, which my little pointer is pointing out in the upper left of the screen. But not all of that habitat is suitable or, or even accessible to fish, migratory fish. A 
you know, Chinook salmon and steelhead are big fish. So they need somewhat larger streams and we're way up in the headwaters of the East Fork. So some of the streams are just too small to be suitable for those fish. But those streams that are suitable after the project is complete, both during operations and after, there's gonna be around six miles of additional habitat made available for those fish that's suitable for spawning or rearing or both. And some of these areas are gonna be relatively unimpacted or not impacted by the project and are in pretty pristine condition. Other places like the main stem of the East Fork it has been historically impacted and those areas will be enhanced as part of this project. And then other parts, like this is Meadow Creek here, this has been historically impacted and will be impacted again by this project. And that's why it's labeled for restoration where the stream will be diverted during mining and then restored over the top of these features when it's all done. So what does all that look like? The upper East Fork, the area that I said was relatively uh, unimpacted historically, these are a couple of photos of what that looks like. There's an, there's an area that's been burned uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, and you can see a number of these trees are now rotting and falling down and creating excellent habitat in the stream, pools, sorting gravel, and we saw lots of juvenile fish hanging out in here. Now there are resident fish that are, remain up here, but this area is inaccessible to anadromous fish, those migratory fish, without trapping and hauling those fish in a truck. You go a little bit further upstream and you're outside of the burn area, you're in a spruce forest and there are a number of meadows, lots of gravel bed streams, undercut banks, uh, really quite nice and relatively pristine. And so then the rest of the area that's not already uh, in good shape either needs to be enhanced or restored. And I wanted to show just a couple of images from projects that I've worked on in the past that illustrate what that may look like. We have areas that are relatively low gradient where we can create new banks. And these, these photos on the left were taken about a year after construction. So this channel was completely rebuilt and these banks uh, were vegetated the year prior. And then somewhat steeper stream channel where we can have riffles and pools and we add large woody debris. So all of these things, we have a number of tools that we can use to uh, either enhance or create an, uh, new habitat in areas where it didn't exist before. So that all requires a design. And here, here's an image of one of our designs, just an excerpt of what the stream is gonna look like over the top of the yellow pine pit. And I'll describe this in more detail later. But I just wanted to illustrate that in this case, the stream, the East Fork is flowing from left to right across the channel, or sorry, across the, the screen. And you can see the aerial image in the background, the restored channel as shown in this blue line, is gonna add more sinuosity, a broader floodplain, and a number of side channels. And I'll, like I said, I'll talk about that in more detail in the future slide. And then here's an artist's rendering of what this may look like when it's done. And this is actually based on our design and the topography from uh, the CAD drawings from the expanded yellow pine pit. So there's an existing yellow pine pit here. The channel will be routed around this in a tunnel during, during mining. The pit will be expanded and then backfilled so that we can create a new floodplain and a new channel flowing across the surface and revegetate that. So in time, it will function and look to be somewhat of a natural channel. And that's what we're aiming to do is emulate natural channels wherever we are. There'll be some remnants of the mine pit left over around the margins, but the stream channel itself will be largely restored. All right, so the stream design, what does it look like? And I like to show this picture at the beginning of this part of the presentation because this is Meadow Creek up on the project site in a section that was not restored, but is literally on top of old tailings deposits from past mining. So uh, even without thoughtful restoration, the, the ecosystem can be relatively resilient. And this is an area where the channel has evolved into uh, a condition that is providing relatively good habitat, especially considering uh, the condition it was in uh, several decades ago. But we are aiming to, uh, to do a better job than that and actually have a lot of forethought into what the stream design should look like as it's being restored across the top of some of these features. So as we mentioned before, there are a number of goals with the uh, stream restoration. The first and foremost is fish passage at Yellow Pine Pit, the tunnel during mining, and then with the restored East Fork over the top of the pit when it's all done. And for all of the streams then, we're either going to be restoring them because they're going to be diverted uh, during mining then placed back over the top of the feature or enhanced in an area where it's not being moved. The restoration I'll, I'll talk to, uh, the enhancement somewhat less, so I'll speak to that now. 
really we're aiming to add large woody debris, boulder clusters, um, pools, areas, uh, you know, enhanced areas that are currently lacking habitat. And as I'll explain toward the end of this presentation, there's been a lot of work done to document the baseline or existing conditions across all the reaches in this project area. So we know which reaches are deficient or lacking for woody debris or habitat elements, and we can go and add those even in sections that aren't otherwise proposed to be impacted. And then lastly is to provide a net ecological benefit. We recognize this is a trade-off. The project has been the project area has been significantly impacted, so it's starting somewhat below uh, what would be a sort of natural uh, level, and then it's going to be further impacted. But then we have the opportunity then to restore those those impacts and aim for a condition that's better than uh, overall is better than what we started with. All right, so when we are pre preparing a stream design, we try to develop objectives, obviously, so that we can, we're not just shooting in the dark. And those objectives are both biological and physical. And uh, physical objectives, I often refer to geomorphology. I'm a geomorphologist, a scientist by training, and that just is somebody who works with, it, it's a, a subset of geology. It's somebody who works with recent geology, soil erosion, sediment transport, and streams. So on the biological side, as I mentioned, we're focusing on several key fish species because they're bellwethers for the overall ecosystem. And so we are using a lot of available fish data and working with our fisheries biologist partners to understand what those fish need in order to uh, survive and thrive. And then on the physical side, we're evaluating the conditions at site and in neighboring sites and called reference conditions and other places so we can understand how should a natural stream function through this valley and what can we do to enhance that natural capability so the stream doesn't just look good day one but it actually evolves over time and and is resilient to things like forest fire and climate change into the distant future so i'm going to walk you through that a little bit when we start a stream design the first thing we have to do is delineate different reaches we recognize that all of the rivers aren't the same, all of the streams aren't the same, and even within one stream there are different areas that function differently. So we need to understand which of the, where those areas are since we'll treat them differently. And so that's a reach delineation. You can see a table of a number of the stream restoration reaches we've identified on the right. As we move further along then we start to evaluate reference sites. So those reference sites they don't necessarily represent ideal conditions, they just represent conditions that are existing in other streams nearby so that we can compare. If this particular area on site has been impacted, what should it look like? What are some examples? And we try to pull the best examples out, or the best scenarios out of multiple examples. And so you can see down here at the bottom, we have some of our proposed restored reaches and we're comparing them to different reference reaches on site that are comparable so that we can say, well, the, there was good habitat at this reference reach. How was that formed? And let's try to emulate that in our restoration project. So that's how we use our reference sites. And we have 22 or 23 reference sites in the vicinity of the project area that we collected a bunch of data from. Here's an example of one. This is on Sugar Creek, which is a tributary to the East Fork immediately downstream of our project area where a lot of bull trout spawning and steelhead spawning occurs and shook spawning for that matter. And so there were a lot of good conditions that we could measure here and take those and, and set them aside so that we could compare uh, our proposed conditions and try to emulate these uh, high quality habitat uh, features. So the next thing is broken out into three pieces, and one of them is the reference site data as we're developing our design criteria. Those are our physical measurements. They, they are what they are. The next thing we do is try to fill gaps. You know, we, we can't measure everything everywhere. So we develop empirical formula that we can use to fill gaps from one area to another. And a good example of that is the channel sinuosity or how how windy the channel is. Essentially, if we're, as I discussed earlier, there are some areas as, after mining is completed that the, the valley gradient will actually be changed because there's going to be development rock or, or, or tailings deposited in, in the valley bottom. And that changes the gradient of the valley. And so we need to 
build a stream over the top of that and understand what the appropriate sinuosity is or how windy should the stream be. And you can imagine if it's steeper, streams tend to be straighter. And if it's relatively flat, streams tend to have a lot of sinuosity or lots of curves. And so we can measure that on dozens, or in this case, we measured hundreds of different stream channels and plotted that out in a statistical way so that we could evaluate for particular discharge or how much water is in the stream and the gradient of the slope, what should the channel sinuosity be? What's an appropriate uh, sinuosity or how windy should it be? So that's just one example of an empirical formula that we produced. And then lastly, there are a number of published design guidelines, including well-known published empirical formula that we can use. So we can compare our formula from the local data to national and international uh, you know, published documents and guidelines and start to pull all of that together to calculate what the appropriate channel should look like in an area if we're rebuilding it. And that's an example on the right where we've used a number of these different formulas to calculate appropriate channel geometries and floodplain areas. And we can then begin to evaluate if the stream that we're proposing is appropriate for the site conditions that will exist when the mining is complete. And so boiling that down a little bit, you know, I, I mentioned the geomorphic uh, physical characteristics, the, the geomorphic targets or you know, how the channel changes physically, we are aiming for a handful of things here based on some assumptions, one of which is that low gradient habitat is kind of few and far between in these headwater streams, just naturally because we're way up in the mountains, but it's those types of low gradient systems that typically provide the best habitat for fish. And so we've identified those areas where that are or are or can be low gradient as higher priority. And so we're trying to maximize those lower gradient areas. And we do that by actually increasing the slopes of areas that aren't low habitat, or I'm sorry, low gradient. So you can think of that like a slope versus a set of steps. If you have a, a steep ramp that you're trying to walk down, it's all one consistent gradient. And maybe it's, it's pretty steep and not very suitable. But you can change that into a series of relatively flat slopes and relatively steep slopes like a set of steps. And that's in effect what we're doing here is all natural stream systems have steep areas and areas that are less steep. And we can maximize those areas that are less steep that provide the greatest habitat in this way, similar to providing um, a, a stair step analogy. And in those low gradient areas then that provide the that have the greatest opportunity for creating and maintaining good habitat, uh, we're seeking to create conditions that are meadow-like. And that's a picture on the right of a forested meadow in Reardon Creek, which is one drainage over. And it, it is a really good reference because that stream actually had, this meadow was formed as a result of a very large uh, glacial-related landslide that dammed the river and created a steep section and by over steepening that section, it created upstream of that a relatively low gradient section. So there's actually a lake, Reardon Lake, and then this meadow. And so that represented an excellent reference condition for us to be able to measure and compare since we're going to have similar conditions at the project site after mining. And then on top of all of this, the goal for any stream restoration project really that we work on is to increase the in-stream diversity for and habitat complexity. And in addition to making sure the shape of the stream is right, we can do that by adding structures to the stream like wood, woody debris and rocks and, and things like that. All right, I'm gonna get into a little bit of the weeds here and I'm gonna try to keep, uh, I'll, I'll speak to it at a high level, but anybody who's interested can pause and kind of read through some of these details. Um, as we advance our stream design, we get into the physical design criteria. Okay, so there, we essentially, if we're building a new stream channel, we need to know how wide should it be, how deep should it be, how sinuous or, or uh, windy should it be, and what should the shape of all of those bends look like. And all of that can be calculated and measured, as I described earlier, using the reference reaches and those empirical formula and the uh, uh, literature. But I, I want to point out just one of these uh, in particular, which is the floodplain width. Floodplains are essential to streams because 
they allow the stream to dissipate their energy. If all of the flow is concentrated in the bank during a large flood, that's a lot of energy concentrated. It's like having a fire hose turned on with the nozzle down, and so it sprays really high velocity and, and it erodes and, and can create a, a lot of um, can create a lot of erosion and unravel your stream. Uh, in a stream that's functioning really well, there's often a floodplain where the the flood energy can be dissipated out on a broad area, and that floodplain then it, it, it isn't just it isn't just formed as sort of an accident. The channel uh, forms naturally to be able to engage its floodplain at certain times, and most streams in our area through published uh, research tend to access their floodplains about every one and a half years. And so we have a channel ca capacity of a one and a half year discharge. So that way the channel is built so that it starts to overtop its banks every one and a half years or so. We don't want it to flood at all the time, right? Rivers aren't, aren't flooding 75% of the year, but at the same time, we want it to flood and access its floodplain periodically, not just during catastrophic events. And so we've designed the channel to access its floodplain every one and a half years or so. And then that floodplain is designed to be wide enough to allow the channel to move so that as it evolves, as it migrates and meanders, as sediment is brought into the system and eroded from the system and trees fall in and beavers move in and everything else, the channel has the ability to move and adapt and it needs a floodplain in which to do that. And so we've calculated how broad that floodplain should be based on this sort of maximum amplitude of a meander. And there are a number of equations that we can use to calculate that and make sure then that we're providing a floodplain that's one and a quarter to two times that amplitude to ensure that streams can form the meanders that they need to and still have room in addition to that. And a lot of headwater streams really don't have that space and so we are taking advantage of some of the uh, unique conditions on site to be able to provide that space for the channel to be dynamic and uh, adapt to conditions over time. Uh, likewise the hydrology, hydrologic, hydraulics, and stream type We've evaluated all of these things to do some modeling and calculation of what is appropriate for these conditions to make sure that the right sizes of sediment are moving and the right sizes are staying put. And a lot of that is based on this stream type. At the end of the day, we're gonna have these relatively low gradient meadow-like reaches that increase in gradient all the way up to these steep rock chutes. And so like any stream, there are areas that are steep and areas that are not steep. And we have a number of calculations we can do to see uh, how much sediment can move through. If we have <clears throat> you know, these meadow type reaches, are they gonna have a sandy or kind of fine gravel bottom? And are these rock shoots, are they going to have a coarser bottom, maybe boulders and, and, and cobbles? And so we can begin to calculate that and see what those appropriate uh, grain sizes are and that leads to the final step in the design is actually the engineering stability analysis so we have to be able to say okay these are all the conditions that we want and this is what we think is appropriate at a certain in a certain reach based on its gradient and the discharge but how do we actually build that and so looking at Meadow Creek which is up <coughs> in the sort of upper part of the project area it says it's gonna have a relatively low gradient. And through the calculations I was referring to earlier, we can determine that the stream's probably go only gonna be able to transport fine gravel and sand. And so we're gonna build our floodplain material out of fine gravel and sand. But anybody who's ever dug in a sandbox knows that fine gravel and sand can't hold vertical banks. And stream channels that are in meadows often have vertical or even undercut banks. And so to be able to build that, we actually have to use what we call fabric encapsulated soil lifts. So we take this jute fabric, it's basically coconut fiber that is laid out in big long blankets, and you place that sand and gravel mixture in those blankets and you fold them over on, the, on themselves like this and stake them into the ground and create, I, I call them burrito wraps, so that you create your banks and then plant the vegetation directly in that. And this is an example, I showed this image earlier. This is one year after construction in the upper Lemhi River. 
of, you can barely see underneath the water the edge of one of those fabric layers, and then on top, all of this vegetation that's growing just one year later. In 10 years, this will all be grown up, and as that jute mat starts to decompose, all the root structure of that vegetation will hold the channel in place, just like a natural channel. And these types of structures were actually used 10 years ago uh, on Lower Meadow Creek, in that restoration area that I referred to in one of the very first slides. And you can see little remnants of that, that fibrous um, uh, fabric here and there, but all the vegetation that's now 10, 20 feet tall is holding the, the banks in place. Okay, so we come up with our engineering design and we had a concept of what types of fish we were gonna see, but then we, we really wanna try to refine that to optimize the conditions for fish. So we. The first part is to make sure that the design is appropriate for the physical conditions, the geomorphic character of the stream reach, but then we try to optimize it for the species that we know are going to be there. And so we worked with some fisheries biologists to help us understand what are the preferred habitat conditions or criteria for the different species that we're talking about. And so here are some preferred conditions that were identified for one of our, our fish species. And then we can use those to begin to um, uh, characterize primary and secondary and tertiary objectives for each reach. So Meadow Creek, the lower part of Meadow Creek is really one of the only places, and this is MC4 and MC5 are the lower reaches in Meadow Creek, there, it's really one of the few places where we have low gradients in a, rel in a big enough stream to be able to uh, be suitable for Chinook spawning and rearing. And so that CH is Chinook. Chinook spawning and rearing then is, has, is our number one priority in that reach because it's one of the few places where we can accomplish that. And so we're reviewing our, our, mo our criteria and our modeling to ensure that the stream velocities and the grain sizes that we expect are going to be appropriate for what Chinook like to spawn in and then having rearing habitat nearby and cover for the, both the spawning and the juvenile rearing fish to be able to hide and, and uh, survive. Okay, so a couple of examples. That was a lot of talk about numbers and how we do our design. Let's look at the pictures again. So here's a uh, existing yellow pine pit. Uh, we're looking at the outfall of yellow pine pit upstream and then this is the inlet to yellow pine pit that large cascade that I mentioned and here we are looking at it from afar again the the inlet and so it it's been a, a legacy issue on, on site and as I mentioned it is proposed to be further excavated and mined and then backfilled so the orange in this case represents a development rock storage facility and so what that is is as areas uh, nearby are being mined the overburden or the rock that does not have ore in it needs to be moved out of the way so that they can access the rock that does have ore for mining. And that rock will get placed inside this pit once it's, ex once it's excavated and filled to a point where we can reestablish a stream back over the top. And so Midas was really good at working with us on this rather than just creating a straight line, which is kind of what would make the most sense initially. We thought, well, what if we place the fill from that development rock in such a way that we can create a little bit more, a little bit of a zigzag in this, in this floodplain. And what that allowed us to do is take what would have been a gradient of around 6% and drop it down to about 4.5%, which is much easier for fish to pass. And so it allows us to create conditions that are more suitable or optimized for the fish that we know are going to be uh, utilizing this space. The other thing we were able to do is place those bends in the in the floodplain next to these small, very small but cold water tributaries. This is Midnight Creek and this is Hennessy Creek. These streams, in and of themselves, are generally too small to have fish, and there aren't they haven't been documented to have fish except for maybe right where they meet up with the East Fork. But what we can do now is allow these to flow out onto the floodplain that will be formed and maintained by the East Fork and provide what in essence would be off-channel habitat that's cold water refuge for fish in this area. And by placing them sort of up against the, the valley margin, you can see these little dotted lines represent high flow channels from the East Fork. So when it floods, it'll come out here and flush these out. So any sediment that might accumulate in these small uh, tributary streams will get flushed periodically. So 
during low flow seasons when the Chinook are migrating up and when juvenile fish are trying to use these spaces, they have pools that aren't filled in with sediment and they're nice cold water and they're not in the swift, um, bigger water of the East Fork River. So that's a way that A, Midas worked with us to change their mine plan to accommodate the stream design and B, how we took advantage of the conditions, the unique conditions on site to try to optimize habitat for the species we know are gonna be out there. Uh, so here's a, a bunch of stuff that you're not going to be able to read, but just an illustration of what our stream design looks like in this reach. And we have a similar design for every reach where we illustrate what a, a plan view and a, and a profile view and cross-section view would look like, and then fill in all these numbers off to the side in tables. So based on all the calculations we've done and all the reference reach comparisons to say, this is what the gradient should be. This is how wide the channel should be. This is the type of material that it should flow on, um, so on and so forth. So all of those things have been specified in our stream design. And as I mentioned, optimized to the extent possible for the species that are gonna be utilizing this space. And one other unique feature that is worth talking about at the project site is a streamliner. So, on top of the yellow pine pit, as I mentioned, that pit is gonna be excavated and then backfilled. Well, when it's backfilled, the rock it's backfilled with is relatively porous. And so if there's not something keeping the water up, you have the risk that all that water will just fill down into this void space in these rocks and your stream would go dry. Now, over time, all that void space gets filled up, but for you know tens of years, that, that won't. Uh, maybe even hundreds of years. And so what Midas Gold is proposing is to place a streamliner, this dark black line that you can see uh, beneath the stream. But it's not, we've had some people think of this like a slip and slide. You're just gonna let, set that thing down there and put a few rocks on top of it and that's the end. And that's not the case. And as you can begin to see in this cross section, which is not to scale by the way, the floodplain is actually much wider, but to fit it on a screen, we have to kind of shrink it up. We're we're calculating what the maximum scour depth of that stream would be and placing the streamliner well below that. And we're also, as I mentioned, calculating how wide the floodplain needs to be to allow the channel to meander and migrate around. And we're placing the streamliner at depth well outside of that margin. So, and then on top of the streamliner, there's a little bit of armor layer that's placed, but then all this what we're calling engineered stream material, what it really is, is just alluvium. It's the type of material that that stream channel would have deposited on its own had it formed itself. Um, and so it'll be gravel, sand, and cobbles. So that the stream has the ability to scour pools and migrate laterally within this area and never actually access this liner. But what the liner does is allow the the hyperreic groundwater, all that near surface groundwater that's associated with the stream to stay up by the stream and not get lost at depth. Uh, now, some of the groundwater modeling that we're not doing is suggesting that this groundwater after mining will actually rebound and come back up. So as I mentioned, the streamliner is really just there for the short term until that groundwater level has is, is been reestablished. But I, I don't wanna give the impression that the streamliner is somehow creating the bottom of the channel. It's well, it's buried well at depth and is there just to help ensure that the groundwater is, is in contact with the stream over the first uh, several years of the project completion. All right, at the end of the day, when the project is built and the streams are done, we need to make sure that they're actually functioning. And so as part of the uh, regulatory process, we're developing these performance standards and performance criteria so that we can, uh, A, upfront say, this is how things are gonna be evaluated. And then B, in the future, after they're done, go out and say, did we do what we said we were gonna do? And if not, there's an, op an opportunity to adaptively manage the project so that you can meet those criteria. And, and you know, the permits that Midas Gold is seeking will require that they meet these performance criteria. And so these are still under development, but in general, the early on performance criteria are associated with ensuring that the project was built as designed. So we have as built compared to the stream design. The next set are these physical channel con uh, characteristics, ensuring that the various uh, conditions that we said were gonna be there are there in the numbers that we said. And then riparian vegetation will be planted and ensuring that the adequate species, composition, 
um, you know, density of those plants are growing as, you know, rel as predicted. And at, at the end, we have what we're calling the functions and values. And this sort of second part of this presentation is all associated with how we've measured the stream function. And there was a lot done to measure the conditions at the baseline or the existing condition. <clears throat> and then we've predicted how the, those conditions through all of the mining and after and so having those predictions gives us criteria to say well we said in five years it should look like this does it and we can then compare existing versus proposed and make any adapt adaptive management changes that we need to so speaking of stream functional assessment let me go into that and show you how we measured and evaluated the existing conditions on site and uh, moved and predicted how the channel might uh, would look in the future. Haley and Shelly, do you have any questions before I move forward that you want to ask on behalf of anybody who might be watching this? I think you're doing great so far, Rob. I think we'll hold our questions till the end. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so the stream functional assessment, there's a bunch of words here that I'm going to blast through. Just want to focus on, you know, this is for com uh, compensatory mitigation. So uh, we're required the project is required to offset the impacts with compensatory mitigation or you know basically uplift that's equivalent to or greater than the impact and we've measured this and are evaluating this over the life of the mine through various phases of the mine not just at the beginning and at the end okay so that another way of looking at that is there are a number of debits that are associated with impacts and there are a number of credits that are associated with the restoration we just have to make sure that our calculation of the credits matches or exceeds the debits at the end of the day and so that's the trade-off i was mentioning at the beginning you know there there have been historical impacts and there will be impacts associated with the proposed mine but those impacts are proposed to be offset by uh, improvements enhancement and restoration that i referred to and those are the credits so the credits and debits have been uh, evaluated using a, what we're calling a ledger, the Stream Functional Assessment Ledger, or SFA ledger. That essentially, like a ledger in, in uh, finance, is basically a big spreadsheet. And so we, count, we add up all of the impacts from year to year, and we add up all of the improvements from year to year, because all the impacts don't happen at one time, and all the improvements don't happen at one time. In fact, Midas Gold has made a concerted effort to try to provide a number of the restoration improvements early on to offset the early impacts so that it isn't just this big deficit for a number of years that's all made up for at the end. And there's a good illustration of that at the end that I'll show you. As part of the ledger, we've provided a lot of user-defined functionality. So some of the project partners are really interested in one fish species over another. And so you can kind of look at what conditions are more favorable for that species versus the other and, and kind of turn off some of the other features that are less desirable, or you can weight certain features higher or lower. So there's a lot of functionality to the tool to allow different users and different stakeholders that we're, we're working with, including the regulatory agencies, to be able to evaluate the things that they're interested in. But at the end of the day, it is just one tool of many. It's sort of a clearinghouse of a lot of data that have been uh, taken over the years and a lot of modeling that's and design that's been done to predict the future conditions and display that in a in a variety of different formats but for any one particular element that's evaluated there there is data associated with that that you can dig down into uh, outside of this stream ledger and so what's actually captured in the stream ledger it started with what are called the watershed conditions indicators matrix and the US Forest Service uh, has put this together and in the Payette and Boise National Forest there they have a number of criteria associated with these elements so you have indicators that are associated with uh, the, the watershed and each indicator has various elements that you can measure and the these WCI, the Forests 2003 document that was updated, I think in 2010, actually um, evaluates these things and says, okay, what is the large woody debris frequency? What is functioning appropriately for large woody debris? How many pieces of wood do you have to have per mile of stream for that to be functioning appropriately? Or how many pools do you have to have? And so we can begin to compare against documented uh, literature, how 
are the existing and proposed conditions functioning using these elements? So we start with the baseline data. And so from 2012 all the way through 2019, various baseline data have been collected to evaluate these different elements. And then proposed conditions, we have the interim period, which is during mining, and the restored period, which is after. And then we actually produce what we're calling the fully restored, which represents a time period after which vegetation has been, has matured. So on the order of 100 plus years out so that we can see how the, the shade and the large woody debris recruitment in particular would affect the, the system in the out years. But all of that's been calculated through various uh, numerical modeling, uh, designs, and professional judgment, and a lot of coordination with the regulatory agencies, the Forest Service, in developing these, um, these uh, evaluation criteria. And then those are quantified over time, as I mentioned. We've done that for every year of the proposed mine, all the way out through 100 plus years. And then that's been done at every at different reaches. As I mentioned early on during the stream design, not every river and every reach within every river functions the same. So we can't assume that the conditions that were measured at one site are appropriate for another site. They're only appropriate for the area that are is relatively nearby and of the same conditions. So we have to break the channel out into consistent reaches. And, and that is a little bit challenging when we're talking about moving the river around during various phases of the mining because under baseline conditions, it may look like this and we have these different reaches denoted by these black dots. During the interim condition, during mining, it might be diverted in a, in a channel that goes around. And then once it's restored, it might have a totally different character. So we have to make sure we're comparing apples to apples and developing consistent reaches. So anywhere where we have a reach break, at any one of these phases has to get carried through to all of the other phases. So this reach is compared to this reach is compared to this reach for an apples to apples to apples comparison across the whole life of the mine. So that was step one in uh, breaking up all of the reaches and then populating it with data. And so the data that we populated it with are originated from raw data for the baseline condition. And as I mentioned, modeled and, and designed data for the future condition. And it all gets boiled down into whether it's highly functional or, or of moderate function or of low function. And the forest refers to this as functioning appropriately at risk or unacceptable risk. And we quantified those as saying it's a three, two, or a one based on, on which category it falls under. And those conditions are summarized here off to the right to say, you know, how many pools per mile do you need? How many pieces of wood per mile? And you don't necessarily have to read this or you can pause and look at it later. <clears throat> but most of those conditions were already documented in the Forest Services Manual, but some of them were left qualitative saying, you know, it should have few or it should have many. And we had to work with the agencies to quantify those numbers. And others were, were intended for a watershed scale and now we're applying it at a reach scale. So we had to change some of the numbers to be appropriate for reach scale. And so there was a lot of, of coordination and negotiation that went into developing these thresholds for whether something was functioning at high, moderate or low levels. So then all of that kind of gets pulled together into this, quant into, this, um, into this ledger that I mentioned. And the ledger measures both quality and quantity. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail here. So the quality component, okay, this is what we're calling a functional index. This was done for every single reach. Basically, it, you take the FI's functional index. Some of the elements can be weighted. We're, we produced a, a, a version of this where none of the elements were weighted. In other words, they're all weighted the same. And so we can sort of ignore this for, for simplicity. And then you have an element score that either one, two, or three, if it's high, medium, or low uh, quality. So you take that, you divide by all the weights, but since we don't have any, that goes away. And so you take the sum of all of those values and divide by the maximum. And that gives you essentially a percentage. Is it, where, where is it? Is it, if all of them were threes, it would be functioning at 100%. If all of the values were one, it would be functioning at 33%. That's as low as it can get in this, in this math. So every single reach, the quality of habitat, the functional index falls somewhere between 100% and 33%. And so that's the quality component, like I mentioned. But at the end of the day, the ledger outputs what we're calling functional units. And so that combines quality and quantity. 
right? Because you can have really high quality habitat in one area, but if you don't have enough of it, it doesn't do any good. Likewise, you can have a lot of quantity of stream, but it's all of terrible quality, so it doesn't do any good. You have to have the right combination of both. So the quantity of stream was, uh, was quantified based on the length of that stream reach and its stream order. But because some of the non-perennial streams actually have a stream order of zero, stream order, of course, is just any two streams that come together create a stream order of one. Once two stream orders of one come together, it creates a stream order of two. When two stream orders of two or greater come together, it's a stream order of three. So the bigger the stream, the larger the stream order. And so this is a surrogate for how big or how wide the stream is, and this is how long it is. So you can think of length times width is your area. So this is sort of a quasi area or quantity multiplied then by this percentage of quality gives you a functional unit. And that's the output that the stream ledger produces. And so here's an example, um, Meadow Creek. You know, this is a, a relatively high quality stream and you can see the functional index that measures quality is pretty high, 72.5% or 0.725. And, but the functional units are relatively low, only 2000 because it's short. This particular reach happens to be short. It's only 852 feet long. Of course, I can't see this because it's behind the, the um, pictures of myself and Haley and Shelley, but um, the, the stream length in the East Fork in this case is really long. And the functional index, although lower, so it's of lower quality, this reach is of lower quality than that reach, the functional units are much greater because of the length. And so it's that combination of quality and quantity. You know, this reach is so short, if combine it with the reaches upstream and downstream and it starts to offset, uh, you know, starts to compare to this East Fork reach. So that's how the ledger works. It evaluates quality and quantity for the baseline condition, which is the numbers illustrated here, but also for those predicted future conditions. And what that looks like at the, the output at the end of the day, the answer, if you will, is this. So if we add up all of the, all of the proposed restoration across the whole project life, and you can see there's a lot of it that's done early, and these are the mine years. So minus four, three, two, and one, that's construction of the mine before any mining starts, which is why it's a negative time, negative time frame. Mine year one is after all that construction is done, you start mining. And then you see mining is over right around here and you stop really having any major impacts other than a few roads and things that are being moved around. And you have the last little bit of restoration, but a lot of restoration happens early. And you can see most of the impacts happen early, although there are a handful that happen later on. And when you subtract the impacts from the restoration, you get this net value. And that's the, that's the answer that we're looking for. And you can see, after year seven of mining is the lowest we get and all of those functional units add up to a, a deficit but at the end we have a surplus at that all that is achieving our objective at the beginning which was to try to leave the site better than where we started so that's the output of the ledger as it sits now for one of the alternatives that's being proposed in the in the environmental impact statement and that's it so Haley and, and Shelly, I know I, I just talked a whole bunch. Uh, do you have any questions for me on behalf of anybody listening? Yeah, thank you, Rob. First off, that was fantastic. Um, I do have a question that is a pretty common one that gets asked and not brought up is, so in your opinion, having, you know, as a ge geomorphologist, as a scientist, and working not just with my school, but other mining companies, the general public, there's a, there's a common opinion that um, there's an assumption that in mining that the companies only intend to meet the bare minimum, right? That they're only going to build a plan that be, you know, that so they can get a permit, they can mine, and then they can walk away. And that's, you know, both environmentally from requirements during mining as well as in the reclamation side of things. And I just, you know, want to have you answer, would you say that you would agree with it based off of your experience in, in, as a geomorphologist? Um, it is a common perception, and I think it's accurate in a lot, a lot of times. It has been different for us with Midas Gold. There was some hesitancy on our part to actually work for Midas Gold and a mining company, and we picked up a copy of the plan of restoration and operations and read through it before we actually agreed to 
to work from Ida Gold and saw what they had proposed to do. I think a really good example of where Midas Gold is is different is the is Blowout Creek, which I didn't even talk about in this presentation. Blowout Creek is a tributary to Meadow Creek, which is then a tributary to the East Fork and the South Fork and the Salmon. Blowout Creek was naturally dammed by the lateral glacial moraine of a glacier during the last ice age and created this beautiful meadow. Well, during the historical mining period, uh, that meadow was augmented by a dam uh, to impound water so that they could create electricity for the, the town of Stibnite and to um, you know, allow for the use of a lot of mining equipment. And then that human constructed dam failed and created a, a lot of erosion downstream of it. It basically kind of removed the, the surface armor on the what was a naturally steep slope and the area for the last 60, 70 years has been a perpetual source of sediment as a result. And the meadow upstream of that dam has incised on the order of 12 to 16 feet so it no longer functions like a wet meadow and it's now a dry meadow and the, the stream is really not of any high quality anymore. And so that area, the, that Blowout Creek area, is outside of the proposed footprint of Midas Gold's project. Yet Midas Gold is proposing to restore it early on. So when I go back to this image, oops, too far some of this improvement early on is associated with restoring Blowout Creek, which is outside of the project area, uh, both fixing the sediment problem in the steep part of Blowout Creek and then also um, creating a, a grade control structure to allow the, that incised uh, meadow channel to fill up again and, func and you know, basically reconstitute that wet meadow. So yeah, long answer, but um, the, the take home message is, yeah, Midas Gold has been different and uh, it's, it's turned into a, a real positive for us to work with them. And they absolutely listen to what we have to say, which is um, refreshing. Kind of piggybacking off of that, Rob, um, this is a lot of information and it is great information and you explained it really, really well. And then what it also showed to me is that you guys have put a lot of time and research and baseline study and um, information together. How long has it taken you guys from start to finish to get to this point? Um, that's a really hard question to answer uh, because like anything else, there's the actual time. It's We've been working on this project for three and a half plus years now. Um, but of course we weren't working on it 100% of the time, uh, but you know, hundreds, thousands of hours at, at our company but also, you know, Midas Gold actually sought us out to work on this project, recognizing that our company specializes in stream restoration. That's all we do. We don't do anything else. There are a number of engineering companies that are generalists, and they do a lot of different things, and they may or may not um, be very good or focused and specialized in stream restoration. So, you know, to Midas Gold's credit, and not to try to pat ourselves on the back, but you know, they sought out people that did stream restoration so that we can be uh, a more efficient in what we're doing and b um, you know push the envelope toward restoration and less so toward the reclamation. Those images at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you, Rob. I think that's a great point. You know, really to kind of hammer in this. Everybody who works for Midas Gold, and as Rob just said, uh, as consultants, contractors. And really, as a part of the Sydney Gold Project, when people hear mining and headwaters, I think all of us really, you know, we took a, a very hard look on where we were working. And, and it's a very uh, easy project to get behind once you see all of the components and the efforts that Midas Gold really is going above and beyond in a lot of aspects to make it the very best that it possibly could be. So, again, I uh, just want to thank you, Rob. I, that was fantastic. I know. You do a fantastic job in, in making a very complex subject very understandable for the general public, so we appreciate that. As I'm sure everyone who is viewing this webinar can see that uh, within all aspects of our project, Minus Gold and our consultants take real-life data and scientific applications. We take them very seriously. 
And in doing this, it's in building the best project and implementing some much needed environmental restoration plans up at Zipnet. We are very grateful here to have people like Rob and Rio working alongside us to really truly make the Zipnet Gold project the very best that it can be. So again, thank you, Rob. For anybody else, we will be having um, opportunities, whether it is through open office hours or you can email, it, email us at community at MidasGoldInc.com. If you have any questions regarding anything towards Rob, his presentation, we would be more than happy to, to talk with you and work further there. And again, thank you for joining us. So thank you, Rob and Shelly, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.